Chapter 6, then. Chapter 6 is uh, more advanced results on sequences. We've got a very important one under our belt with the sequence criterion for closeness. Now we want to push things a bit further and look at more advanced facts about sequences by looking at subsequences of sequences. Because even when sequences don't converge, quite often you can take a subsequence from them, throwing away some of the bad terms, and end up with a sequence that does converge. So it's much easier to have a subsequence that converges than it is to converge yourself. The other way around is fine. If you do converge, then your subsequences converge as well. Well, what is this business of subsequences? Well, let's start by reminding you about nested intervals and, and nested D cells. So here's a result from last year. If you take some closed intervals, non-empty, so I'm going to assume that AK is less than to BK here, non-empty closed intervals. From now on, if I do write this sort of thing, I will be assuming that AK is less than to BK, because otherwise it's a bit of a silly notation. So you've got these intervals, and each one contains the next one as a subset. So I1 is a superset of I2, which is a superset of I3, and so on. Then there has to be at least one real number which is in all of them at the same time. In other words, if you intersect all of these intervals, there's still something left that's in every single one of them at the same time. That x is in I1, and x is in I2, and x is in I3, and so on. Now, if you use uh, intervals that aren't closed, this can actually go wrong. Not using the example we looked at with open intervals before, where the intersection had one point in, but you could also arrange, for example, for a sequence of open intervals decreasing to have intersection which is actually empty, which is done by keeping one of the endpoints constant. The, uh, the example we had in the note before, we had minus 1 over n and 1 over n, and both endpoints shrank in. When that happens, then you do end up with something left. But if you keep one of the endpoints, say, fixed at 0, and let the other endpoints tend to 0 from above, then you end up with an intersection that's empty instead if you're dealing with open intervals. But closed intervals, that can't happen. And it's a very useful result. Now, we won't prove that this year because you had that last year already. Um, you might want to think about how you would prove it if you had to. A uh, little bit of extra information. Often, there's quite a lot of points left. For example, the sequences could well, uh, let me give you two examples of intervals, one where you have one point left and one where you don't. This bit at the end here says that if the lengths of the intervals tend to zero, then the point is unique. So here are the two examples that you might want to think about. Um, if IK is minus 1 over K up to 1 plus 1 over K, then they shrink down all right, but what they tend to is a closed in for naught one. So here the lengths don't tend to there and you have infinitely many points left. So just a quick picture of that situation. Here's naught one. In fact, I'll just, uh, here's my limit interval. And these other intervals are converging down to it. Um, they start at, my, the first one is minus 1 up to 2, which is quite big. But then, of course, they start getting smaller and smaller. And I'm not going to be able to do infinitely many of them. But as you can see, they shrink down. I haven't done it very well. These closed intervals shrink down, and they, the sort of limit closed interval is not 1, which happens to be equal to their intersection. Whereas, 
if you took i k to be minus one over k to one over k, then the intersection of the ball has just got one point in, because the lengths do tend to zero. And the nested interval theorem told us there was going to be a unique point common to all of those. And it's quite easy to see what point that point is. It's zero. And of course, if you wanted to check the details of it, you could check it the way we did with the open intervals in uh, a previous section. So what is that BK minus AK turning to zero? Well, as I say, that's the sort of length of the interval. Another way of seeing it, it's about as far apart as the points can be. If you take two points, if you take two points in one of these intervals, A, K, B, K, then the furthest apart they can be is B, K minus A, K. That's the length of the interval. It's also what you can call the diameter of the interval because it's the furthest apart two points can be. So what is the diameter of a set? Well, in general, you don't find a maximum. You normally have to take a supremum. But if you've got a non-empty bounded set, then its diameter, you look at all possible distances between pairs of points. And, well, you may not be able to get a maximum, so you take the supremum instead, the least upper bound. And you know that will be finite if you've got a bounded set. Um, if it's an unbounded set, you tend to say it's got infinite diameter. So, so you can say the diameter is infinite if you've got an unbounded set. Uh, the diameter of the empty set is a bit tricky. Uh, so what's the correct diameter of the empty set? I'm not sure. Some people might say the diameter of the empty set is zero. Other people might say the diameter of the empty set is minus infinity because uh, generally it's accepted that the supremum of the empty set is minus infinity. Mathematical conventions, let's not worry about the empty set, it's a special case. But for a non-empty bounded set, naught is less than or equal to the diameter, is less than infinity, and you don't normally expect to get two points a maximum distance apart, but for closed D cells it's different. You actually do get a pair of points that are as far apart as possible. For non-empty closed D cells, what you do is you take a pair of points that are at diametrically opposite corners. So you take one point at the bottom left near, well, three-dimensional speaking, bottom left nearest point and the other one at the top right furthest point or something like that, and they'll be diametrically opposite. There's lots of choices. It's a bit easier to draw it in two dimensions, so let me draw you in two dimensions what the diameter of a closed two-cell is. So you take two points at opposite corners of your rectangle. It's a closed two cell, so they're actually in the set. And that's your maximum possible distance. Um, so here, A is a closed two cell, and that's the diameter of A there. So it's actually achieved for once. Whereas if it had been an open two cell, all you could have done is get close to those corners or two other. I mean, obviously, you could, use the, you could use these other two corners as well if you wanted. You could have had that corner and this corner, and they would have been uh, just as far apart. If it had been an open two cell, then you wouldn't have actually achieved this maximum distance. There wouldn't have been a maximum distance 
but the supremum would have been the same because you could obviously get very, very close to that distance using points in the two cell. Just take, just go out along that diagonal, if you like, to a point that sort are of very near the corners, and that way you can get as close as you like to that number. And then by the time you take the supremum, you end up with the same answer. So the diameter of the open two cell and the diameter of the closed two cell is the same. So what's the d-dimensional analog of the nested intervals principle? Again, if I don't, uh, if I talk about closed intervals or d cells now, let's let me assume that I'm talking about non-empty ones, in case I forget to say that, because the empty case is uh, not only trivial and uninteresting, it also renders the results false, because if you intercept an empty D cell with, a, with some other D cells, then of course you get the empty set. That's not interesting. So I'll remind you that we're assuming non-empty here. So now you suppose you've got some decreasing sequence of closed D cells. You can think two-dimensionally if you like. So I think a closed rectangle is getting smaller and smaller, and the next one is always inside the previous one. And the claim is then there must be something that's common to all of them, something in the intersection of the lot, at least one point that's in all of them. You can actually use the one-dimensional nested intervals principle to prove the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional and so on one, um, if you think about what's going on with the coordinates. So you can actually deduce the higher-dimensional one from the lower-dimensional one. And when is it unique? It's unique if the diameter tends to zero. So that exactly corresponds to the one-dimensional result. And so a typical picture might look something like this. You've got a big closed D cell, and then you take a smaller one inside it, and then a smaller one inside that, but you don't know exactly where they're going to be. They don't have to be sort of central. But as long as they're shrinking, then there will be at least one point common to them all. Here's a typical picture. In that picture, it looks like maybe the diameter is tending to zero, but they don't have to. Just like with the intervals, the diameter, it, they could all shrink down to some particular non-trivial closed D cell. So you could have lots of bigger rectangles coming down and shrinking down to a smaller rectangle that's sort of not degenerate, or they might shrink down to one point, depending on what happens with the diameter of the, these shrinking rectangles. Okay, that's rectangles, but you can do the same in, in, uh, in higher dimensions and with D cells. So we won't prove that. I'll leave it to you as an exercise. Oh, I've already done a typical picture for D equals 2, so I don't have to fill in that gap. As I say, you can actually deduce it from the one-dimensional one if you look at what it means to be in a D cell. To be in a D cell means you've got some restrictions on each of the coordinates. And the restrictions you've got on the coordinates are that they're in some interval. So if you've got some shrinking D cells, what you actually get is for each coordinate, you get some shrinking intervals. Then you can apply the nested intervals principle to find out there's at least one coordinate that works. And then you come back and find the coordinate that works. You put those coordinates that work together, and you get a point that's in all of the um, relevant D cells. So it's actually quite an easy NEB exercise. That means that uh, this not examinable as book work, but could come up in some part of some other, que some other part of some exam question, you might be asked to say something about this. You are supposed to know the result and be able to apply it. And so now we come on to, well, next we'll be coming on to subsequences in the Boltzmann and Weierstrass theorem. And we'll deal with that next time.